starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar about staying on top of customs compliance risk and regulations. My name is William Barnes Graham, and I am the Digital Content Manager at Open to Export. We are an online community helping small UK businesses get ready to sell overseas through our step-by-step -step articles and guides, regular webinars, Ask the Experts forum, and our Export Action Plan tool. You can find all of these on our website at www.opentoexport.com. Open to Export is powered by the Institute of Export and International Trade, the UK's only professional membership body for international trade, offering a unique range of individual and business membership benefits, education and training catering for beginners through to master's degrees, and an always exciting and prestigious programme of events celebrating UK businesses' exporting achievements. We will be running a live Q&A at the end of the session, and you can ask questions at any point during this webinar using the, the question box on the control panel to the right-hand side of your screen, as indicated on this slide. Before introducing our speakers, I'd just like to remind everyone that in the Institute's recent Export Optimism Survey, only 30% of respondents said they had any strategy for avoiding the risks involved with customs compliance which is a surprisingly no, low number given the potential impact and cost of getting this aspect of exporting, uh, doing it right or wrong. So today's fantastic speakers will be addressing this and giving tips to, towards coming up with a, a plan for, for dealing with it. To begin with, we'll have Mike Jostopenko from the Institute of Exports and International, International Trade addressing why this is an important point for exporters to cover. We'll then have Chantelle Rowe from XTS Solutions giving practical advice for businesses on how to create a strategy for dealing with these risks. XDS Solutions are a one-stop shop export compliance service, including mandatory conformity assessment program and certificates of conformity. Finally, we'll hear from Adrian Bird from International Freight Forwarder Newbreed, and Adrian will be sharing some of his day-to-day -day experiences helping businesses to overcome some of these challenges involved in customs compliance. But to begin with, over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, Will. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. Um, Will mentioned in the introduction uh, the recent Institute of Export uh, Confidence Survey, um, and one of the, the results from that was that only 30% of businesses who responded to the survey had a strategy to deal with customs compliance. Um, I think one of the reasons for that, uh, Will, if we can move slide, thanks. One of the reasons for that, I think, is that businesses, particularly at the newer end of the spectrum, typically uh, see customs matters and customs compliance as something that's dealt with on their behalf, either by a freight forwarder or by a carrier uh, handling goods going in and out of the country. Um, but as we'll see during the course of today's sessions, it is something that's very important for any business that's, ex that's trading internationally. So I'm going to give you a general overview of customs procedures and highlight some of the things that as a business you need to be aware of. Our subsequent speakers are going to be covering uh, some of that subject matter in more detail and look at specific areas of concern. So I'm looking at customs declarations as a general, general concept and customs declarations tend to happen whenever goods move into or out of a country whether they're imported or exported. It's worth saying at this point that the um, concept of import and export in the language of HM Revenue and Customs is only considered to be when goods travel outside the European Union or come in from outside the European Union. Um, that's where customs uh, formalities become involved. And while we remain a member of the, uh, the, the single market in the European Union, um, those aren't considered as export and import transactions. But generally speaking, customs declarations are required um, whenever goods pass in or out of a country and they serve various functions for governments um, they allow governments to have a sight of and to have control of goods which are coming in and out of the country and either to restrict or to prevent or at least keep a track on goods which it thinks is uns are unsuitable so we could be talking about selling 
uh, arms weapons to countries and obviously governments will want to make sure that they only go to countries where which they consider safe sound and stable uh, it could be importing or exporting illegal products which they want to prohibit entirely it could be products which uh, require special oversight such as foodstuff products which need an inspection so customs clearance asks acts as a point of barrier which allows customs to identify and examine goods where necessary Many countries will consider collecting duties or, you know, and taxes on importing goods as a valuable source of revenue for that country. Many countries have gone down the route in recent years of reducing import duties because they see greater benefits for promoting international trade. But even so, revenue is an important element of any customs declaration. And also, very importantly, countries use the information they collect through customs declarations to put together statistical information on trade trade flows. So it allows us to know how many, how much we good, how much goods we sell to countries around the world, and how much we buy, which uh, compile to make our, our national trade statistics. As I mentioned, many companies see customs as something that's handled by freight forwarders or customs agents or carriers, and that's true. Most customs entries which are made in the United Kingdom are made by customs brokers or forwarders on behalf of the trader, the exporter and importer. But it's very important to realize that even if an entry is being made in your name by somebody that you're employing as a professional, any customs declaration that's done in your name as an exporter or an importer you are responsible for the information and the accuracy of the content that's contained on that customs declaration. So there is a legal obligation on you to understand what's being declared in your name and actually to make sure that the, the information is correct and valid. Thank you, Will. So customs declarations for those in the UK and across the EU these days are almost always submitted electronically. Once upon a time they were done in paper form, but these days they're submitted electronically. And the UK Customs have a system which is known as Chief, Customs Handling of Import-Export Freight, which is the computer system which controls and administers electronic customs declarations inbound and outbound. Now, it should be said that that system is quite old and is due to be replaced roughly around the time that the, the UK leaves the European Union, so that will be uh, an interesting experience. But the information that's submitted to a customs entry in the UK and across Europe tends to be fairly, well, it, it's identical across the European Union, and it serves for certain specific purposes. So when looking at the sort of information that's needed for a customs declaration, it's worth considering the basic questions that customs would be asking themselves whenever goods are imported or exported. So we've got those on the slide. So first thing they'll want to know is who, who's, who's importing the goods or who's exporting the goods. Now on a customs declaration, that's done by something called an EORI number, which stands for Economic Operator Registration and Identification Number. So that's a unique reference number for any VAT registered business. The number is actually based on your VAT number, and it's an essential element if you are importing and exporting, because it'll be needed for any declarations that are made in your name. The next question that customs will always want to know is what? What is being imported and what is being exported? What are the goods? And that's done by means of a tariff code which identifies the products, which we'll talk about in a moment. They'll also want to understand why goods are being imported and exported. Many, many exports are fairly straightforward. They're goods which are being sold to customers around the world, but goods can be imported and exported for a range of different reasons. And customs will want to know why. A customs procedure code is a series of digits which tells customs the reason for that inbound or outbound movement. They'll also want to know how much, so they'll want to know how many packages, but also what the value is and what the net weight. This is largely for statistical purposes, but that information is necessary, and any customs agent that's filling out a customs entry on your behalf will need to know that information from you. The next answer is where. Where are the goods going? Where are they coming from? Um, uh, that's very important, as we'll, as we'll see in, in a moment and later in the slides. So looking at some of those subjects in a little bit more detail, thank you, Will. Customs tariff codes. As I mentioned a moment ago, tariff codes are a way for customs authorities around the world to identify what goods are by means of a series of digits which classify goods in a specific structure and hierarchy. 
Uh, these days, most of the countries around the world, all of the countries which are members of the World Customs Organization, which is 181 of the, the major trading countries, all use a common system, which is known as the harmonized system, which makes customs classification a lot easier for businesses trading internationally. What that means is any country which is a member of the World Customs Organization and which uses the harmonized system, uses the same structure for customs uh, ta tariff numbers, down to the first six digits of a tariff number. That means that if you know your UK or EU tariff code, then the first six digits of that should be the same in most countries that you're likely to be selling to. Now, it's worth saying that customs tariff codes are different lengths, and it's important to remember that the harmonized system only covers the first six digits. So in the EU, the UK and the EU, we use eight digits, usually for the point of exportation, and a minimum of 10 digits when goods are imported. So what that means is that any digits after the sixth digit are local and specific to the European Union and would be different from the equivalent numbers on any tariff code elsewhere. But even so, the first six digits provide a good starting point. As you can imagine, it's very important to know the tariff code for your goods. Um, a freight forwarder, a customs agent will usually ask you what the tariff code is. And it's important for you to know it because you know your goods. You're the one that's able to classify your goods accurately. It's worth bearing in mind that the, that did those differentials within the harmonized system. So if you do get a tariff code from a supplier that's based outside the European Union, the, the, there may be some small differences in the tariff code beyond the sixth digit. So important to check in the UK or EU tariff what the correct tariff code is. So we need to think about how you're going to classify your goods. Now that's a very important subject. Um, but the starting point for most people will be the copy of the customs tariff, which is on the gov.uk website. And that sets out the tariff, and it also has a very useful search facility. It can be a bit daunting the first time you use it, but the search facility does make it easier. And the, 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 the rule with the tariff is you, you classify goods based on what they are, what their function, what they're comprised of, and what, they, what, they, what they're used for. And there are very specific rules to follow when classifying goods. These are known as the general interpretive rules, and they're set out internationally, and they are a hierarchy of rules which guide you through the process of classifying your goods for a customs tariff. There are also some very helpful chapter notes and section notes in the tariff at the start of each chapter and each section in the tariff. And it's very important to read those because they can provide with useful help and they are compulsory, they are binding. You cannot ignore them just because it suits you. There are also various resources to help you from HM Revenue and Customs. They offer guides to classifying certain goods, particularly the more complex and, and contentious goods. And even more important, they can offer you a service called a binding tariff information ruling, where HMRC will actually classify your goods on your behalf. Now that is a free of charge service, and you can access that by going through to the, um, the gov.uk website, and you can find more information at the link at the bottom of this page. So do use that. If you're having any doubts about the customs tariff, use the binding tariff information service. That's a very valuable resource. Thank you, Will. Other information that we touched on earlier, values. Every shipment has a value, even if there is no price. So even if there is no sale involved, a lot of people, if they're sending out goods either as samples or where there is no commercial transaction, perhaps temporary exports, are very tempted to put a nominal value or to declare no value. In customs law, all goods have a value and they must have a realistic and accurate value. And again, there is a hierarchy of procedures based on World Trade Organization rules that tell you how to value goods, even if there is no sale or no purchase very important to understand the importance of uh, so the, the role of valuation. So please don't, if you have goods that are worth a thousand pounds and you're not charging the customer, you can't just put a nominal fee on there. Customs procedure codes I mentioned earlier, they tell customs what's happening with the goods. So you may be sending goods out for a straightforward sale, but you may be sending goods out 
on a custom, a temporary exportation, either for an exhibition or to be repaired. You may be bringing goods in to be repaired. You may have goods which are under some form of customs control. Customs need to know this, so you need, it needs to be explained to them on the customs procedure code. And even more importantly, your freight forwarder that's doing the entry for you needs to know if you're using any of these procedures because they're the ones that will put that declaration onto the customs entry. Origin as well, I mentioned earlier. Origin and the destination of goods can be very important. If you're importing goods, the, imported, the, the, the origin is very significant because some goods may not be allowed to be imported from certain countries where there are sanctions or embargoes. Similarly, you may not be able to export goods to certain countries if they're on, on an embargoed list. But at the other end of the scale, there can be an advantage. If you know what the origin of your goods is, and the origin is not the same as the country that you're shipping from, you have to prove what the nationality of your goods is, where they were essentially manufactured and processed. But if you can prove that the goods are of UK or EU origin, you may be able to take, the, take advantage of free trade agreements, and your goods may be able to attract a lower rate of import duty when they arrive at the destination. But please do be aware that origin is not a simple question. Just because you're dispatching the goods from the UK, they're not UK origin goods. And I think that will be covered in a later presentation. Thank you. So just to sum up on this on this introduction, the basics are very important. You ought to know the basics of customs formalities, particularly the, the, the tariff codes, the, the, how to classify your goods. You need to know what the tariff codes are, not just to be compliant for customs, but also because it can be very important and helpful in finding out lots of other information about uh, regulatory rules and import duties in overseas markets. So you need to understand all the points that we've just touched. The more you understand, the less likely you are to have problems, and it builds your knowledge of international trade. And secondly, once you've got the information, make sure that you give it to your forwarder, because they're not psychic. They're very professional, they're very knowledgeable, but they don't know your business. So you need to tell them what's going on whenever you export or import a shipment. You need to tell them the who, the what, the where, the why, and how much, so that they can put that information into a customs entry, make sure that the entries are accurate, prevent understanding, misunderstandings, errors, penalties, and fines, because if things go wrong with HMRC, there can be severe consequences. So avoid all of that, understand the basics, and make sure you communicate with your freight forwarder. So on that note, thank you very much for listening. I will pass down to, to Will, who will now introduce the next presenter. Thank you, Mike. As ever, really great overview, some really great practical tips too. Um, and just to make notes for the Institute of Exports, shipping office team uh, is always on hand to help with these sorts of things, and Mike is part of that, so um, definitely worth checking that out. But now I'm um, delighted to hand over to, hand over to Chantel, who's, who's going to talk about customs com more about customs compliance um, from her great and kind of vast experience talking about that. So over to you, Chantel. Thanks, Will. Um, just mentioning earlier, I agree with the export survey that was done and was very promising. It absolutely supports what we're starting to see at XDS in terms of the number of documents that we're issuing daily, especially for British businesses. I mean, international trade is high on the agenda for British businesses nowadays, with 54% of them crediting it as their single biggest opportunity of the year ahead. I mean, this, however, does set a few alarm bells as 70% of businesses surveyed actually have no plans in place to remove the risk that is associated with customs compliance or the documentation uh, for various countries. Action needs to be taken, of course, for, to ensure that British businesses don't leave themselves exposed to this risk. I mean, this can in return cause costly fines, delays in shipments, and even risk of companies being blacklisted in various different customs around the world. So what I'm hoping to do today is provide some exporters uh, with some simple advice and some top tips in how to help ensure them to avoid the most common compliance uh, mistakes made and put their businesses on the best footing. So just a brief overview, if you can move on please Will, thank you. Just a brief overview who I am, um, as, most, as you know Chantal Rowe, uh, we're the specialist in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, markets in particular where there is comp uh, export compliance programs in place. Our day-to-day -day focus is on customer services and we work with clients from a wide range of industries, mainly from startups to multinationals. 
and we do this on the phone and face to face. But every day we are getting more and more clients who are contacting us to understand more about what documentation is needed, especially for these mandatory conformity assessment programs. Next slide please, Will. So basically, governments around the world place rigorous requirements on importers. And this is what they call the um, conformity programs, which are mandatory. They do this to protect their consumers from goods that are substandard. These requirements can be complicated and cost, uh, constantly changing. As we all know, in customs um, all around the world, rules change. And we arrive there with our shipments and then discover that things have um, changed. 70% of aspiring exporters have no plans to place um, the risks of customers' compliance. Is this a surprise? It's not really, to be honest. Historically, exporters have been unsure who is ultimately responsible for customs clearance. Some would argue the exporter is, some would argue the importer is. And so have not always taken the right steps to safeguard their supply chain. But the rules are very clear. Certificate of conformity programs um, and country of origin requirements are a mandatory part of the document process for many countries, um, such as uh, countries in Africa and the Middle East. And it is the exporter, not the importer, who is responsible. And from time to time, you will always get an importer who will say, just send me the product, X works, I'll handle everything. Now, with them handling everything, that is most of the time just referring to getting the product um, from A to B through a freight forwarder. What they're not explaining to you is that when you're sending a product into, for example, Saudi Arabia with your brand, your company name, and that your importer is not getting the documents um, in the correct manner, it arrives at customs, and at customs, the exporter as well as the importer can be penalized. On many occasions, the exporter might not even be aware of the penalization because the importer might have dealt with it directly. But what this really means is that you could eventually be blacklisted or even flagged up as a warning. Should you want to ship to another customer in that particular country, your shipment could get stuck or get slowed down through customs process. Businesses who begin shipping to new international markets without the required documents in place will quickly become unstuck. So failure to clear customs will result, as I said, in delayed shipments. Frequent business will face costly fines and repeat offenders could suffer blacklisting along the way. As, the only, as one of the only few companies managing the whole entire process from beginning to end, we understand the barriers to customs clearance and how to overcome them. Next slide, please, Will. So, there are four main fundamentals that need to be taken into consider when exporting to various countries that have compliance programs in place. One would be the timeline. Two, con certificates of conformity. Three, country of origin certification. Four, product testing. So, let's l dig a little deeper into this. Next slide, please, Will. So the timeline. Never has the sailing, saying, fail to prepare, prepare to fail, been more applicable than when you're exporting to compliance, uh, to co uh, conformity compliance countries. Our top tip is if you're considering expanding into a new international market, then we would take a close look at the customs compliance requirements before you take your first order, not shipping after your first excitement consignment. So basically what does this mean? It just means identifying you're going into, say you're going into Kenya for the very first time. Identify first before you actually accept your order what is the requirements that you need to comply to in order to get that shipment from your location to your customers. Fail to do this and your importer will either receive a warning have to wait for customs officials to carry out a very costly inspection at the importing country or find the consignment is rejected and returned to the exporting country. Most of the time, the exporter is then held responsible to remove the product from the importing country and pay for the costs involved to bring it back. So both the exporter and importer's details will be also held on record at that particular customs. And if this happens repeatedly, then the export business is at a risk 
of becoming blacklisted, as mentioned earlier. Moving on. Certificates of conformity. Okay, so part of the country's conformity programs. Governments around the world place very rigorous requirements on importers. They do this, as I said before, to protect goods that are substandard. This means that in order to clear customs smoothly, your shipments will require certain monetary certificates issued by an approved accredited body. As part of the country's conformity assessment programs, without the certification, shipments will not be granted access. This applies to both air freight and sea freight. The only, um, the only thing, the only way that people get through customs without this documentation is normally if they are coring a shipment and is considered a small package. Anything else that is considered a air freight or a sea freight does require these documents. Uh, just to name a few of these conformity programs that are actually in place, you've got the Middle East, you have Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Iraq, Kurdistan, Qatar and Lebanon. Africa is an expanding um, continent with these programs becoming more and more popular there uh, with countries like Kenya, Nigeria, Uganda, Egypt, Ethiopia, Ghana, Tanzania, Algeria and Botswana. One of our tips that we always give new companies considering going into these markets is that it's cr critical to understand what a, con a certificate of conformity uh, standards apply to the product and what you are shipping, as they vary enormously. To stay top on top of these constantly changing standards and take steps to ensure to comply before you're taking your first order. So for example, if you were considering Saudi Arabia, as an export destination, there are a few important things to be aware of. The majority of imported products are subject to a SASO, which is the standards, a Saudi Arabia Standards, Methodology and Quality Organization Conformity Assessment Program. Quite a mouthful, I agree. To clear through customs, these imported goods must be accompanied by a Certificate of Conformity, which is commonly known in the market as a SASO, COC, um, the COC must be issued, uh, issued by an authorized inspection agency. There are quite a few of those nowadays. But to drill down, there's more. With new regulations being added all the time, for example, all imported goods must carry a non-removal indication of um, state in the origin. Now, this can differ from product to product, depending on the size of the product and the nature of the product. All lighting products and lamps must carry a compliant energy efficiency label. That's just recent regulations that have been brought into place. Cosmetic products, they must all comply with the eCosma notification system. These are all complicated processes that are in place, but don't need to be if you have the right support helping you and guiding you through it. Most of the time, your importer should be able to give you this information, but it's always best to identify for yourselves when considering a destination to export to, identifying what the programs and, the, and documentation is inquired. Sometimes your freight forwarder would be able to give you this advice or your local chambers of commerce or even the IOE. All this before your shipment is actually granted entry into the country. At XDS, we work closely with several approved agencies, giving the freedom to recommend the best route for you as based on your product, based on your documentation that you have, based on your inspection locations. And we can move your product, your application, through the SASO process as quickly and effectively as possible. A lot of people avoid going into these countries with these certificates of conformity into place, purely on the basis they think it is a minefield, it is a nightmare, and it's something I just don't have the time or the energy to get involved in. When it gets broken down to you in quite a simplified format, you will actually be surprising, it will be surprising how easy it actually is to go out and get orders in these countries and comply, as long as you've done your homework ahead of time. Next slide, please. I'll just touch a base a little bit on the country of origin, as it Mike mentioned in his previous presentation. So the certificate of origin is also another mandatory document that is required, especially for international trade. And it proves that the particular 
um, export, or the particular shipment that is being exported is wholly obtained, produced, manufactured and processed in that particular country. Virtually every government in the world considers the origin of imported goods before deciding whether to grant customs clearance, but the process is far from straightforward. That's because the country of origin requirements can each differ enormously. So for example, using Saudi Arabia, um, there is two options. You can use, you get an um, EC Arab certificate, or alternatively you can get a full Arab certificate of origin and a legalized invoice. Now, some importers prefer to actually get the full version of the Arab because they believe it clears customs very quickly. Other importers prefer to get the, uh, the EC Arab certificate purely on the basis that it's a lot cheaper and easier to do. This is down to preference and most of the time it's done to preference of the importer. Um, the other, old, other certificates are involved is the ATR1s, the EC Certificate of Origin, EUR1s, Arab Country of Origin and EC Arab. I'm not going to run through what each country actually does and which one is advisable. It's always best to check with either your local chamber or the IOE or you can contact us at XDS and we'd be able to give you the guidance. Going on to the next slide please Will. Product testing. This is anything from handbags to industrial machines. In order to gain customs clearance, all products have to pass certain standards, regulations and product approval requirements. As these will all differ depending on the market you import to as well as the product that you're shipping. Each country can have its own set of requirements for imported goods. For example, Saudi Arabia have changed a lot of their standards recently, um, cosmetics, and low voltage standards toys all have to now comply to the GSO standards rather than the generic um, international standards or European standards. So the first step is always to find out if the goods intend, uh, if your goods that you intend to ship are subject to these requirements. The next step would be to understand what the standards that the goods need to confirm to. Now, in some cases, you may have already completed all the various testing, which is great, that's one box ticked. On other occasions, you may have never needed it previously for the countries that you shipped to and would need to plan this ahead of time, purely on the time that it can actually take to get the items tested. This provides evidence, um, the test report would provide evidence in a form of a, t uh, of a test report and it has to be issued ideally by 17025 accredited laboratory. Now when I say ideally, not all products can actually be shipped and sent off to a laboratory for testing. For example, if you are shipping big um, thousand litre tanks or 10,000 litre tanks, it's impossible to pick one of those up, pop it in the post and send it off to a laboratory to get tested. So we would have to look at what the nature of the product is to actually understand what testing will be accepted. Another example is leather goods must, be met and must not be made from pig skin going into Saudi Arabia as it's a banned article. Leather goods also have to go through various different uh, testing requirements and chemical tests um, in order to ensure that the quality is of high standard. Get bespoke, my advice to you is get bespoke advice on the product testing you require and this will help keep costs in check and streamline your process. The, what we commonly find is people, um, exporters go out to companies, get their orders, get excited to ship their first order off, discover that their freight forward or importer tells them that they need to have a certificate of conformity and everything can fall apart at that point. If you do not manufacture the product you plan to export, then it is worthwhile taking the steps in order to speak to your suppliers to ensure that they have the correct test reports in place. If not, Alternatively, identify laboratories that can actually assist you in getting a, um, some samples tested. This makes everything um, a lot easier when it comes to actually sending your order out to Saudi Arabia or other countries. So in conclusion, identify the challenges and requirements that if you're chosen market early enough. I mean, the report has shown us that business owners and export managers still have a long way to go when it comes to their perceptions of how customs clearance can actually work in some international markets. 
it means that businesses set on international expansion could hit some real big hurdles along the way if they don't plan ahead of time. Now, I'm not trying to give you the scare factor here, but always in order, we're in such a competitive market at the moment. Um, XDS is in a competitive market, you are in a competitive market, and so is your importer. So it's all about making sure that product gets from A to B in the quickest time frame with all the correct documents and gets the green light ahead. So take steps to identify what challenges you and your organization might have and try and get, um, look at those as early as possible. Seek the help from experts, uh, expert people around you and from the various different organizations that can offer you support. And constantly review and update your approach. Very importantly, just because you get your one order through and it runs smoothly, come a few months down the line, you're about to do your next order, there could be changes in place. Then you will avoid all the risks, safeguard your supply chain, and hopefully find international expansion delivers growth for your business. Next slide, thanks. And that's all. Thank you for listening to me today, and I'll hand back to Will. Thank you, Chantal. Some really, um, really useful tips there. It's some really, um, lots, lots to to um to absorb there. I think it's some of the information and uh, technicalities involved there. So now I'm going to hand over to Adrian, who's going to give some of his kind of day-to-day -day experiences as a freight forwarder. Over to you, Adrian. Thank you very much. Uh, hi there, my name is Adrian Bird and I'm the Quality Manager at Newbreed Freight Limited. Uh, we provide services throughout the world to all main ports, including the US, China, India, Saudi and Russia, as well as the EU. This includes cross-trade, direct shipments in all shapes and sizes by road, sea and air. And we also handle difficult shipments and difficult countries on projects. We have a good working relationship with both the UK and German customs and Rotterdam, although recently I have found German customs to be a little bit more difficult than usual. Within the freight industry, in general, it is very important to have the necessary tools to provide accurate services as well as knowledge of customs compliance. Next slide, please. Since May last year, the new UCC rules, the Union Customs Code, was introduced, initiating new rules for companies throughout the EU, which could cause some companies transitional issues. The main point is to make sure that all your documentation is correctly applied to each shipment, including export, import, clearance documentation, consular documents, certificates of conformance, and any other documentation or requirements for that particular country. In addition, there are other various hoops to jump through including further outlay for larger deferment accounts, SOLAS, requirements for VGM, and a potential requirement for becoming AEO, that's Authorised Economic Operator, to streamline customs reporting procedures. Next slide, please. It is vital that any UK, EU co company, understands that good manufacturing records are a necessity to ensure that the correct rules for manufacture are adhered to to ensure that all product components are sourced correctly to benefit manufacturer laws based on component HS codes and origins to try and maintain a UK manufactured product with preference. Preference being the, uh, the item where you can pr produce documents and not your customer not pay any duty within the free trade agreements. When exporting to free trade agreement com com countries, thus reducing, nullifying your customer's duty charge on customs clearances. If you do keep correct records, i.e. long-term declarations, bills of materials, and product records, you can use these to benefit and create correct movement documents, EUR1s, your meds, to provide this to your customers. Next slide, please. In addition to this, there are other export documents that may be required in your exports, EC Certificate of Origin, British Arab Certificate of Origin, certified legalized invoices for certain Middle East countries. Another reason to ensure that you keep good records is the requirement for certificates of conformance on exports to certain countries such as Saudi Arabia, this is SASO, and Nigeria, SONCAP. If you are a manufacturer, it is important to ensure that you are accredited under the correct ISO requirements. For example, ISO 9001 or TS 16949. You can then follow the correct ISO requirement to test your products accordingly. 
If you do export to Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, etc., you must be able to present recent product test reports as well as your accreditation as an application process to obtain your, to obtain your certificate of conformance. Without the certificate, your products will be seized by customs and you'll face hefty costs and fines and delays. Please be aware, if your products are deemed as high risk, you cannot appraise your own manufacture. It needs to be tested under the ISO 17025 laboratory conditions. Unfortunately, these test reports only have a three month validity. You can control all of the above stated requirements in a database, access or SQL format to ensure that the information can be easily retrieved. Next slide, please. Sorry, in, in my experience, XDS helped me vastly for customers' requirements for SASO and SONCAP. Chantel has attended business management meetings with me to ensure that the correct and compliant information is relayed directly. I would suggest and advise that any company handling any size shipments to countries that require certificates of conformance to go to XDS. If I had done this, it would have saved me a lot of time. My advice to everyone is to ensure that you keep all your products and export records, look at systems that could, where there could be a risk, isolate the risk with procedures and add it to your system process. Plan your manufacture, your component sourcing to provide UK EU manufacture to qualify for the preference benefits and pl plan your document spread accordingly. Don't just fill your order book with sales you can't commit to. Ensure you have the infrastructure to provide all the necessary requirements to use all the benefits that are available. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. And um, yeah, some some good 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 advice there, definitely. We're we're going to now hear uh, open the floor for questions. So um, please do ask questions at any point using the control panel on the right hand side of the screen. And, and the first one we're going to ask is from Nina. Um, and this, this is sort of two questions. I'm going to put them to Mike first. Um, the question is, what is the process if exporting goods but not in bulk? And Nina's saying this as a direct-to-consumer business where she sells goods online. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering if you could address kind of direct-to-consumer as well. So over to you, Mike. OK. Well. As we've seen in the various presentations today, customs, customs regulations come in two forms. First of all, there are the customs regulations that you need to conform to to get your goods out of the country of export. So you need to do a declaration at the point of export. And then when the goods arrive at the destination country, they need to be imported and cleared through customs in order to be allowed to, be, to, be, to enter in and to be delivered to the end customer. As a general concept, customs clearance procedures will apply whatever the size, whatever the value, whatever the type of transportation. So whether you're selling business to business or business to consumer, you will still have to deal with the customs clearance process when the goods leave and when they arrive. And when they arrive, depending on the nature of the goods, they may be subject to import duties. In practice, however, um, some countries there are some, some exceptions to this. Some countries have what are known as de minimis limits. In other words, they set a limit, a value of consignment, and below, if the consignment has a value below that level, they may choose either not to collect import duties um, and taxes when the goods are imported into that country, or they may have a simplified customer's clearance format. To give an illustration, uh, goods entering the USA, most goods entering the USA, um, if the value of the goods is below $750, then customs in the USA will not normally charge duties. But by comparison, if the goods are going into Canada, next door to the USA, the threshold where your goods are exempted from duty is usually only 20 Canadian dollars, which is far less than the USA. So if you're selling to consumers, one thing you need to be aware of is to, uh, to make them understand who is going to pay any duties if they occur. So whether you're going to subsidize that and bear the costs of any duties, or whether your, your customer is going to pay that, and they may be contacted by the freight company, by the post office, by the courier service, and asked to pay the duty charges. So if, if they're not expecting that, that can be a nasty surprise. Some low value shipments have a simplified customer clearance procedure, particularly if they either go by post or with one of the small parcel services. These, because these move large volumes of small shipments, they have simplified procedures where they bulk up numbers of shipments. So you may have to uh, treat 
that slightly differently. That that allows it to be done in a simplified way. But if you're exporting goods to a country outside the EU and you're about registered business, you still have to have a proof of export for VAT purposes so that you don't charge VAT on that transaction. Of course, that assumes that you're about registered business. And that applies whether you're selling directly to a consumer or to a trade client. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any other thoughts on that. No, I'm going to take that as no, but yeah, thank you, Mike. That's a really good, comprehensive uh, answer. And the next question we've got is from Frank, and he, I, I suppose this is for Chantel. Uh, he asks whether it's advisable to go through the CB scheme for testing products. Uh, Chantel? Yeah, no, I can answer that. It really depends on what the product is and which country it's going to. Um, if he's mentioning CB scheme, then I'm assuming it is most likely to be electrical products. Yes, the CB scheme is a very um, popular program. It is um, a testing process, and we do accept those. So, again, it, my advice is it really depends on the product and the country going to. Um, Mike um, could always... Frank, sorry, could always seek some uh, advice growing more into detail of that information, if need be, from either IOE or from us directly afterwards. Thank you. Thank you, um, Chantal. Um, and another question, is this regarding to changes on SONCAP relating to life-endaging products? Um, and it's a question from uh, Karen, and it's just about whether the certificate, what, how does the certificate have to be issued under these new changes? Um, okay, yes, this is a recent change that has just taken place. Um, it came into play on the 30th of March, if I'm correct. And the the process is, is this. The, the authorities in Nigeria, SONCAP, uh, SON, Standards Organization of Nigeria, issued a list of products based on HS code, which they now consider as high-risk items. These can be certified as a Route A certification. Uh, for those um, on the call that are listening in that don't understand that, Route A is a one-off uh, one shipment and is mainly down to companies who are not manufacturers or where fat factories can't be audited. They would have to apply for a Route A. So yes, it is very possible um, to do it. Um, the other alternative, if you are a manufacturer and you do ship regularly into Nigeria, this particular product, we can always do a factory audit and this then removes the need to apply for an inspection on every occasion. So again, it really depends on the frequency of the shipments um, in order to identify the best route possible. But again, as I mentioned previously, um, I'd be more than happy to run through that on a case-by-case -case basis and assist clients, which we have been doing quite a bit over the last month, trying to find the best solution for each one. Thank you, Chantal. Um, the next, next bit is not so much a question, but more a remark from another Karen, and it's just to say that um, uh, Karen mentions that the market access database is a, is a really useful tool for research, and um, yeah, absolutely agree with that, and uh, that's something we've referred to in previous webinars as well, so um, definitely recommend looking up that for, for, for much of the finding out about customs procedures for different countries. Um, the next question is for Adrian, and it's it's for it's about certificates of origin and the question is from Melody. How long for the date of invoice can a certificate of origin be applied for? Uh, to your agent. Um, that's a difficult one, but uh, as far as I'm aware, um, the, on other documents you can actually defer them where you actually put a note on other documents. But for a C of O, as far as I'm aware, I would imagine it could be a month. But uh, I've not heard anything to actually. Uh, deal with that at all. Uh, I've not had any problems with any invoicing on the date, but I would uh, I would ask your uh, local Chamber of Commerce for a definitive answer on that. Does anyone else have anything, anything to add, add to that? I'm sorry? Uh, anyone else got anyone to, anything to add to? Oh, add sorry. To that? No? It may depend on the destination country. Uh, obviously, this certificate of origin has to be accepted at the point of customs clearance by the destination country, so there may be local variations there. Thanks, Mike. Um, I've got another question for Chantel from John. Um, and John says, Chantel emphasised that it's the responsibility of the supplier for the entire export process, even if it sells X works. 
And he asked, why is the novel responsibility of legal owner of the goods as defined and understood under the Inca term classification? Uh, so Shanta, if you could just clarify that a, bit, a little bit for John. Sorry, could you just repeat that again, please? So he asked, why is it not responsibility of the legal owner of the goods as defined and understood under the Inca term classification? Okay, it really depends on the situation. If you are the exporter and you are just the trader company and you've bought the items from um, a manufacturer and you're reselling them on into uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait or any of those countries, it would be the exporter's responsibility. However, in most cases, we do try and encourage the manufacturers to obviously take their own responsibility. But from what we've found in the past, a lot of manufacturers would turn around and say, well, they're not exporting their product, they manu their product, manufacture their product. They meet the rules and compliance procedures of the country they're in. Any additional testing that they need um, or a trader would need would need to get it done themselves. When I emphasized during my presentation about it's not the responsibility of the import. You see on many occasions importers saying to um, the companies that they're purchasing products from, all right, I'll take it X-Works, I'll handle all the freight, um, just send the goods to me. And when the exporter contacts them and says, well, we've got to get the SASO certificate or the SONCAP certificate, and they say, no, leave it to me. What we do find is once the goods have arrived in their destination, the importer is then running around trying to get these certificates. And it's sometimes impossible to get because when a product has actually arrived at its destination, it can't actually go through all the regular checks and inspection procedures and so on and so on because it's arrived at destination. So what normally happens is the importer then takes a slap on the wrist, pays a fine. But in recent um, changes in Saudi Arabia, we found that they have now connected um, networks connected up at the various different ports. And what happens is when exporter A ships to importer B, when the goods get stuck in customs for either the documentation not being correct or goods have been sample tested and failed, it's not only the importer that is penalized, but the exporter, regardless if you're the manufacturer or not, could get your name added to a blacklisting. Um, which is quite severe, means any time you ship into the country again, even if it's to a different importer, you could be penalized. Alternatively, it could just ruin your brand or, or your uh, reputation in that country. If you're looking to expand your business to multiple importers, it is always advisable that the exporter take some form of responsibility to ensure that the manufacturer, the trader, and the importer actually tick all the correct boxes. Thank you, Chantal. Um, really, really thorough answer. And a question now for Mike, because um, I know we've done webinars on trade shows before, and it's from Kerry. And Kerry asks, are there any special rules, procedures for temporary exports if you're taking something to an exhibition? Okay, thanks for that, Will. Yeah. Um, the, the, yes, there are, but they tend to depend on the country. Again, there are two aspects to this. If you're exporting goods to an exhibition, you will be exporting the goods, and you may well be re-importing the goods when they finish at the exhibition. So you need to set up the export customs procedures in such a way that when the goods come back into the country, you're not paying import duty on something that's your own product and you originally exported. So um, you may wish to export the goods under a customs procedure um, which allows you to re-import the goods and there are various customs procedures in place to do that. Um, getting the goods into the country of destination will depend on the customs rules in the country of destination. Some countries allow temporary importation of goods. Sometimes that will happen on a, a basis of trust, but more often than not, the importer or the declarant, the person importing the goods, will have to put up a bond to, to, to cover the value of any potential duty until those goods are re-exported. And in some cases, the, the amount of the bond and the amount of administration to do it can be more than the, 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 the actual sort of cost of the, the, the importation's worth. Um, other countries don't have that facility, and you simply have to import the goods and bite on the bullet, pay the import duty. There is another procedure which you may look, consider uh, known as an ATA carne, so that's the letters A-T-A, and that is effectively like a passport for goods which allows them to pass 
out of a country and into a country and replaces the normal customs proce clearance procedure at the point of exportation and importation and also avoids the need to pay import duties. It's only used by certain countries, only recognized by certain countries, and it can only be used in certain conditions. And there are very strict conditions about how you can use it. Uh, one of those conditions is you need to know what the route in the itinerary is going to be, because uh, a carnet is a book of pages of documents, each of which has to be stamped whenever goods enter or leave a country. So you need to know how many, which countries the goods are going to, how many times they're going to go in and out of a country, including the return trip back home. And if any page in that book is not stamped at the point of entry or exit, that can cause severe consequences. It's also very important to note that the goods must travel on a round-trip basis. So if you're going to use a carne as an alternative, you cannot leave goods behind. So for instance, if you're sending out literature that's either going to be given away or thrown away and not transported back, you can't use a carne for those, for those goods. Everything that goes out has to come back in and has to be recorded on the documentation. Otherwise, you could lose your bonds, you could face penalties. So various op uh, options there. If you are exporting for an exhibition, one option is to choose an exhibition folder. They are specialists in transporting goods for an exhibitions, and they will generally know what rules apply in specific countries. And they can advise you on the best solution, depending on the country you're shipping to, the customs procedures that apply, and also the goods that you're shipping and whether you expect them to, to all come back to the country afterwards. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I'm going to do one last question because we're running out of time. Um, and this will allude to something Adrian brought up earlier. Um, it's from Anna, and Anna asks, within the EU, it is sometimes possible to import products from a more relaxed country than the one you're selling into, i.e. importing into the Netherlands and then selling into Germany. And I guess the question is, A, is this something you'd recommend going forward, especially with our relationship with the EU changing? And is there something you can do in other markets in different parts of the world? I think at this moment in time, it's uh, difficult to predict in the future uh, what's going to happen for the movement of goods. But as at this moment in time, if you, if you were buying something in, uh, say, Holland, and then just moving it to Germany, I think it's just still classed as domestic. So um, are, you, are you talking outside the EU? Is that what uh, the question was? Or yeah. I mean, just, uh, I... Internally in the EU? I mean, I, mean, I think um, in, in the short term, it's, it's a question about other places in the world, so outside of the EU, um, and being able to see what happens within the EU as well, obviously. But, um, yeah, how about outside of the EU as well? Well, if you're, if you're buying outside the EU to, to bring into the EU, um, again, it, all, the, all countries are different going out, but coming in, uh, it just applies to all the European rules, and you can check on the... Uh, tariff database and you can check on other other items you just make sure that all the products that you're coming in that are coming into the, your country you've got the correct codes the correct tariff codes and you you've got all the correct paperwork great well i'm um, on that note i think it is probably time for us to wrap up so thank you once again to mike chantal and adrian um, i hope everyone's found today's session really useful much appreciated thank you, thank you. bye bye before heading off, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the upcoming trade summits being run by the Institute of Export and International Trade. These summits bring together industry-leading thinkers and speakers to examine the issues and opportunities in international trade, with Brexit obviously a key topic in all of this. The, these sessions are being held across the country, um, and the, the ones already announced are in the southwest of England and the Midlands, as well as Northern Ireland, and there's more to be announced, so keep your eyes peeled for those. We're going to be announcing dates for our June and July webinars very soon, so keep your eyes peeled for these. We're hoping to address getting paid online when doing international e-commerce and digitizing your supply chain, so plenty of more practical advice on the key aspects of exporting to come. That's all from us for now. Please do take our exit survey as you leave to let us know what you thought of the webinar and to give us any suggestions for improvements or future topics. But for now, thank you very much. <laughs>